everybody! Today we are going to talk about all of the wonderful hognose snake morphs there are. Today we'll be covering all of the morphs that we have here at Snake Discovery and what those morphs do genetically to the snake and to their appearance, but we won't be covering exactly how all the morphs work at an allelic level. So if you don't know what an allele is or you're not sure exactly how genetics function with snake morphs quite yet, I highly recommend watching our genetics part one and part two videos before continuing with this one. They'll be up here. Let's start with the wild type or normal morph of hognose. This is the phenotype or physical appearance of what a hognose snake looks like in the wild. They are actually, they're a gorgeous animal. They have beautiful browns and tans and even whites and black scales on their bellies. Uh, usually more checkered than she is. She has like an all black belly, which is really pretty. This is Bacon here. She's one of our first hognoses that we ever got and she is a beautiful example of what they look like in the wild. So moving on to morphs, we are going to start with the color morphs or the genetic mutations that affect the color of the snake. Then we're going to talk about pattern morphs or the genetic mutations that affect the pattern. And finally, we're going to talk about how those look when combined together. Let's start with the most common mutation or gene seen in hognose snakes and probably other snakes as well for that matter, the albino gene. Albinism removes the melanin or black pigmentation from the snake. However, the albino gene does not remove all of the colors. It still remains or still leaves behind the yellow pigmentation and red pigmentation. This gene turns black scales white and it turns other colors of scales to more of a yellow or a red color since those pigments still remain, just all black has been removed. This also gives the snake red eyes or pink eyes and a pink tongue. The albino gene is just a basic recessive trait, meaning that the snake needs to have two copies of it, one from mom, one from dad, in order to be albino. And if the snake only has one copy of that mutated gene, either from mom or from dad, then the snake will look normal or wild type. However, it will still carry the gene from the other parents, so it has the potential to pass on that gene to its offspring still. This is why it's so important to know the genetic makeup of the snake you want to breed because if it's het albino, that's a lot different than if the snake doesn't carry the albino gene at all and it will therefore influence your offspring. Again, if you haven't watched our genetics part one and two videos, I highly recommend watching it because this will make more sense. Next, let's talk about the exanthic or azanthic gene. This is a mutation that's hard to notice on just a single snake alone. So I have our normal or wild type hognose snake here to compare. As as you can see, the azanthic gene removes the yellow and or red pigmentation in a snake, and that leaves behind kind of a grayscale coloration. So they still have the black pigmentation since it's not an albino trait. Instead, it's actually the color pigmentations that are being removed. Azanthic, like albinism, is a basic recessive gene, so it behaves in the same way. Next, let's talk about the lavender mutation in hognose snakes. This is a unique one to hogs and a couple of other colubrids like false water cobras as well, but you don't see this gene in many snake species. The lavender morph, as the name implies, just gives you a hognose that's lavender or light purple in coloration. Their scales on the top become lavender, the splotches become lavender, just a darker shade of it. Their bellies are even lavender, which is beautiful, and their eyes and tongue even have lavender characteristics to it. This, as you can probably tell, is probably my favorite morph of hognose snakes, and this is Tiffany, our lovely lavender girl, who we hope is gravid this year because we really want to have baby lavenders here. The lavender gene is just another basic recessive gene, so basically the snake needs to have two copies of the lavender gene, one from mom, one from dad, in order to become lavender. But if, if it only has one copy, then it is considered het or heterozygous for the lavender gene, so it can still pass that gene onto its offspring. So again, it behaves the same way that albinism does. This is just beautiful gene and it's believed to be a type of hypomelanism but it hasn't from what I understand been quite proven to be hypo yet. It's just its own beautiful trait as it currently stands. All right so so far we have covered some basic recessive genes so now let's mix it up and talk about what is believed to be a dominant gene or mutation in hognoses and that would be the lemon hypo otherwise known as the lemon ghost. This is a gene that increases the yellow pigmentation of the snake and apparently every time they 
shed, or as they grow their entire life, that yellow becomes more and more prominent. So this is kind of a unique one in that they change throughout their life and they show those colorations even more vibrantly as they grow or age. And since this is considered a dominant gene, whether the snake has one or two copies of this gene, it will display the lemon ghost or lemon hypo coloration. Um, if it has one or two, there's no difference. It'll look the same, but it only needs to have one copy of that gene in order for it to become lemon hypo. Now, I previously thought that this was a line bred trait, but then just by doing some research online, it seems like people are now believing that this is a dominant trait. I'm not sure which one to believe personally, so we have him. We're gonna breed him and find out for ourselves because I don't know what to trust online, so I'm just going to figure it out myself. So this is an example of why it's so important to get information from multiple sources, not just one source, because I did find a site that thought this was line bred, found a couple sites that said it was dominant. So if you can get information from multiple sources or just breed the snake yourself and conduct your own experiment to find out. Next, we're going to talk about the anaconda morph in hognose snakes. And this is not only a confusing morph, but it has a confusing name too. The anaconda morph gives hognoses a pattern change, not a color change. And the pattern change is basically instead of having a bunch of smaller spots like the wild type hogs do, they have fewer but larger spots or splotches down their body. It's called the anaconda morph because they kind of look like an anaconda supposedly, but I mean, if you think about it, this is a real anaconda. And in my opinion, they don't quite look like this snake. Yeah, some of the spots are kind of similar, but there's so many other things that real anacondas have in their pattern that anaconda phase hognoses just don't. So it's kind of a misleading term in our opinion. Yeah, I mean, I can understand how he got to the person got to the point with the bigger spots that are kind of separating and whatnot. Yeah. But if you look at the belly, you know, it's not even close to similar. There's more pattern, so they're not green. So we, along with other breeders, are trying to nix the whole anaconda morph and instead just call it the conda morph for hognoses, make it a whole different term altogether. So as I was saying, the conda morph has fewer but bigger splotches on the back. It also affects their pattern in other areas too. Conda phase hognoses typically have an all black belly instead of kind of a checkered belly like wild types usually have. And they have these beautiful white walls or lines down either side of their belly. It's an interesting pattern, ge pattern gene that actually affects them in multiple ways, not just the spots on their back. The way the conda gene works is actually different than all of the other mutations we've covered so far. The conda gene in hognoses is actually a patternless gene, but it behaves differently than patternless genes in other snakes like bull snakes, where it's basically, where it's just a recessive gene. In hognoses, it's completely different. Let's start with just your basic wild type hognose, which has a bunch of little spots here. This is wild type, normal coloration, whatever you want to call it. If a hognose snake receives one one copy of the conda gene or patternless gene, then it has fewer spots, but it does still have some spots here. So this is kind of a blending of its mom or dad that was wild type and the other parents that had the conda gene that it received. So you've got kind of a combination of both. But if the hognose snake receives the conda mutation from both parents, that's when you get a snake that is actually patternless and it has no spots whatsoever. It actually represents that full patternless mutation. Mutation. And this is what we call a super conda hognose snake, meaning that the snake received the conda gene or patternless gene from both parents. Now, in all of science, this type of gene behaves as an incomplete dominant gene. Another example of incomplete dominance is with flowers. If you were to combine a red flower with a white flower and you got pink flowers, which is just the blending of the two together, that is an incomplete dominant gene. So with hognoses, the patternless mixed with the wild type yields kind of a blend of the two, the conda gene. And again, if the snake has both copies of the patternless or conda gene from its parents, then you have no spots whatsoever. You have that full super conda is what we call it. This in, again, all of science is called an incomplete dominant gene. But in the reptile world, for some reason, we call it a co-dominant trait. I don't know where it began, if someone was confused or if it just somebody was misinformed, but a co-dominant gene is when the offspring shows a combination of both alleles from the parents. For example, if you had a red flower, mix it with a white flower, and you got a red and white flower. That is an example of a codominant gene. So if this were an actual codominant gene in hognose snakes, a 
combo of the uh, patternless plus wild type gene wouldn't create this blending of some spots. Instead, you would have a snake that's half spotted, half spotless. So since they are blended together instead, this is again an incomplete dominant gene. Hopefully that makes sense. It probably didn't if you haven't watched those other genetic videos, but I tried to explain it as best as I could here. As far as we're aware, there are no examples of a true codominant gene in snakes. Everything that we consider or call codom right now, like super pastels in ball pythons or the arctic gene in hognose snakes, which has a super form. Those are all actually incomplete dominant traits. So please help us here. Hopefully we can start it right here today. Start calling the conda gene and other co-dominant morphs incomplete dominant morphs because that's what they actually are called in science. It would also be really cool if there was a co-dominant morph, like a true co-dominant morph, and we just don't know about it because I'd like to learn about that. That'd so. be really cool to have an actual co morph in snakes. The last group of mutations in hognoses we want to cover in today's video would be line bread traits. A few examples of these would be the red hognose snakes. So this is a line bread trait. There's a bunch of others too, like uh, green and twin spot is a line bread trait. Purple. Uh, purple line is a line bread trait. There's tons of them. There's a bunch of them. We don't have many of uh, them ourselves. We like to work with actual genetic traits here, but we still have a nice example of a red hognose snake. And basically line bread traits are just another way of saying potentially inbred, but really just selectively bred snakes. So the snake has a favorable characteristic, such as more of a reddish or rusty brown color here, that is selectively bred with another snake that also has those reddish colorations. And by breeding those together, you increase your chances of having babies with those red scales. This isn't to be confused with like a recessive trait where you breed two albinos together and get albinos. If you breed two red hognoses or two twin spot hognoses, you don't quite know what you're going to get, but you probably increase your chances of getting more of those in their offspring. But again, it doesn't behave as a normal genetic trait does like recessive dominant or incomplete dominant traits. A great example of a line bred trait in reptiles in general would be with crested geckos. In crested geckos there's only as far as I'm aware two genetic morphs, exanthic and lily white. Everything else like the tiger, the harlequin, the dalmatian, quad stripe, quad stripe all of those are selectively bred individuals so they are actually all line bred traits. Basically we're just breeding two dalmatian uh, crested geckos together and hoping that they pass their spots, their, their dalmatian spots onto their young. Same thing with the red phase hognose snakes. You can breed it with another red, hopefully you get more reds as babies, but you won't really know for sure. Okay, now that we have covered the basic single gene mutations seen in snakes or hognose snakes, let's talk about how they interact with one another. This is honestly one of the most fun parts of the hobby for Ed and myself, is seeing how different genetic traits interact when they are combined. This is often seen with ball pythons, which are everywhere. There's countless, it seems, different mutations and color morphs of ball pythons. I think over 5,000 nowadays. But it's so much fun when you can combine a color mutation with a pattern mutation and see what they look like together. Or two color. Or two color combinations. What would happen if you mixed, say, the exanthic gene with the albino gene? Well, you get what we call a snow morph hognose snake. So since this is a combination of both exanthic and albino, the exanthic or azanthic removes the red and or the yellow pigmentation whereas the albino removes the black pigmentation so you're essentially left with a white snake. These are beautiful snakes. We produced our first snow last year which we have held back. Kind of a picky eater at first but she's she's catching up. On the flip side when you combine a color gene with a pattern gene you get something like this. This is an exanthic conda. So we've got the lack of yellow pigmentation for the color gene from the exanthic mutation, and we have the pattern change here from the conda gene. Beautiful combo here. Now what if you combine the conda pattern gene with the albino mutation? Well, you get this. Here's an albino conda hognose snake. So we've got albino coloration there with the lack of black pigmentation, and the conda gene is expressed by those fewer spots. Now, Think about if the, since the conda gene is actually a patternless gene, how about if a hognose snake got both patternless genes or conda genes from its parents, so it's a super conda, but was also an albino? Well, as you recall, here is our super conda gene hognose snake, so no spots at all, full patternless, and when combined with albino, you get this! Here's an albino super conda hognose snake. We actually re recently purchased this guy from a show to use in our future breeding projects. Now he's so, a little spitfire, he just bit me. Yeah, he. 
it likes to eat everything that moves, so he'll grow nice and quick, I think. So same pattern gene here, just this one has the albinism on top of it. But those are all the hognose snake morphs that we have here at Snake Discovery. Here's another example of a conda morph, by the way, just to show you that they do vary. Some have bigger spots, some have smaller spots, but overall they have fewer spots than their wild type or normal counterparts. Let us know in the comments below what your favorite morph of hognose snake is, and what morph, if you haven't seen one before, but you can think of a combination in your head like lavender snow? What would yeah. that look like? I want to know what that looks like. Hmm, there's so many combinations that people still haven't produced yet. That one might be one that they have made, I, I don't know. I bet, it's, I bet it's been done, but we're still learning every year as we breed more and more of these amazing genetic traits together and see how they interact. So that's what makes snake breeding so much fun. You're always learning something new or experiencing something new every single breeding season. So we're hoping we produce some really nice uh, snakes this year. A lot Maybe. of the girls look gravid, so oh, I think we're good. A lot of the girls in today's video were gravid, so they might look fat in this video, but they're hopefully actually just full of eggs. We'll see. Thank you everybody so much for watching today's video. I hope you learned something new. Thank you to our Patreon backers for your endless support. You are so generous and allow us to do so much. And we will see you all next time. Thank <laughs> you.